Hello and welcome, dear influential leaders. This is Alexander, straight from my living room. Nowadays, anything is possible. All you need is a phone, a microphone, and a good story. And you can broadcast to the entire world. Today, I have a very special interview for you with Alexander Den Heijer. He calls himself the Purposologist. All he thinks about is purpose. And the beauty of Alexander's work is that he takes this ancient wisdom from the ancient Greek, the Chinese, the Zen masters, and he applies it in today's world, the business world. All the huge corporations who are striving to find talent, to stay alive, to have a bright future. What can we learn from this wisdom in the business of today? That's what we speak about today. And more specifically, I asked Alexander the question, what is the ultimate purpose-driven organization like? We all speak about purpose nowadays, and it took me a couple of years to figure out what purpose really is. Then I learned there's only two ways to live life. Either you live on purpose, or you live by coincidence. Now me personally, I only live once, so I want my life to be the most beautiful life I can imagine. How does this translate into an organization, into a company where multiple people come together and everyone wants to live their most beautiful life? Why do they team up? What do those dynamics look like? How do they give meaning to the work? And of course, how does this team achieve the results you're looking to achieve? These are some of the questions that come forth in our interview with Alexander. Of course, I need to squeeze in a little bit of sponsoring over here. I make this podcast in my spare time because I love having good conversations. I love to give you content that makes you think, no matter how busy you are, you can educate yourself and change small things in your life so that also you get more and more and more insight, wisdom, and of course the freedom and joy that come with it. Earn More, Work Less is the name of my business. When you go to earnmoreworkless.com, you find tons of resources. You want to get rid of stress in the office, you want to communicate better, be a better leader, have more effective teams. All these answers are questions. All these questions are answered on earnmoreworkless.com. For now, enjoy my interview with Alexander, the Purposologist. Alexander, welcome to the Influential Executive Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. We're here together with uh, Babette. Yeah, hi Babette. <laughs> one of our cats. She's our Zen master today, right? Yeah, she is. And we have another one uh, over here, BB, just outside the shop. <laughs> and uh, I think Shiny is hiding upstairs in one of the closets. Oh, there's a third one as well. Yeah. Nice. Sometimes I go there to take my sports bag. I open the cabinet. There she's laying, just <laughs> away from the world, just yeah. within herself. Calm. Okay. Deep go. meditation. Thank you for joining. Yeah. The Purposologist. Purposologist, yeah. I needed to find a name that didn't exist yet on social media. So I was like, you know, I was thinking about topics such as purpose. And I thought like, you know, kind of a psychologist for purpose. So I thought Purposologist. But I have to do something about it because it's quite a different, difficult name to, to pronounce or to spell. So I'm trying, uh, maybe I will change it. Yeah. And just use my own name. Because I don't speak only about purpose anymore, but more about topics that involve human beings. So, but purpose is definitely one of them. Yeah, and and you're known for your black and white posts. Yeah, I'm a very black and white person. You're yeah, very so black and white. I thought I'm going to do a white T-shirt today. No, it's a book. Yeah, it's called Nothing You Don't Already Know. So it has a twofold meaning. One is there's definitely nothing in that you don't already know, because many of the uh, ideas are just uh, serve as reminders, you know, things we already know. But on the other hand, there's also the idea that everything you learn about yourself is remembering. So there is nothing you don't already know about yourself. You may not know that you know it. So that's the thing, that, that's the double. That's why this, uh, the title is called Nothing You Don't Already Know. It's just reminders about meaning, purpose and self-realization. Brought in a very easy to read simple way that people can just digest yeah. yeah you you like to capture these simple truths 
yeah. which we already know but just forgot about. Mm -hmm. We like to capture them in one simple sentence. Yeah. Now, what is an example of such a se sentence that has made a big impact on yourself personally over the last weeks? Well, one of the... Uh, it's funny, I've, I've, not so long ago, a few months ago, I guess, I was um, on my bicycle. I think it was at night. I just had a few drinks with a friend and we discussed uh, some heavy topics about life. And all of a sudden I had this uh, that sentence popped up in my mind because I've been I was thinking about success a lot when I was younger. You know, I thought how can I be successful? But something popped up in my mind while I was on my bicycle and it was like the point is not to be successful, the point is to be successfully. And I was like, yeah, that's the thing, you know? And then, and I just wrote down the sentence and then I had another one, you know, and I posted it online. I even wrote it in my book. But the idea behind that was that uh, everyone, and I, also when I was younger, I wanted to be successful, but now I'm often wondering, like, how can I be successfully in the world? And what does it involve to really be in the world? And the whole way of being is so much more important to me right now in this phase of life, I guess. So that's an example of a sentence that just pops up. That, and, and that's also... Um, that that kind of I don't I don't know how to say it but it's often it happens when I've been thinking about a problem like for a very long time very deeply and then just these insights pop up and I just write them down and I share them on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. But what I really uh, appreciate is you just before the interview you told me about the little process you have in place for making these quotes. One thing you do when you come up with such a sentence is you type it into Google. Yeah. To make sure nobody else. Has. Yeah, I always I always look whenever I write something because there's a. It's too. It's yeah. There's more to it because. Whenever I have a thought, you know, how do I know that is my thought, and how do I know that not someone else has thought that before? And I do think that everything I think has probably already been thought before, uh, maybe in different words or maybe in. Uh, a different way of putting it out so but what I often do or what I always do is when I when I have a sentence I write them down and I type into Google to find out if the same thing has already been said by someone before if it has already been said by someone and I use this person and then I promote this person but if it hasn't I just uh, write it under my own name but it's a difficult thing because especially with short sentences the the, the the uh, probability that it has already been said by someone is of course huge yeah. even if it's not on Google it might have been said by someone already so that's a bit of a, a, a thing and I always uh, believe that especially when things are true you know from an experiential level let's say it like that then these things have already been uh, known uh, way before me and you know this, they're all old ideas Nothing. That's also why it's nothing you don't already know. They're just old ideas, maybe written in a more, uh, in a way that people can absorb easily right now in this time. Yeah, yeah. The ancient Greek already uh, knew everything. Of course, right? yeah, knew the everything. Plato, yeah. Socrates, yeah, the Buddhist, or uh, you know, all the great philosophers, but also the great um, teachers of of the past time. Yeah, and I'm very interested in. Uh, reading about them and uh, diving into history. Yeah. One thing I am very excited about exploring together is what the ultimate purpose-driven organization looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very great topic because I've been thinking about that a lot. And maybe we also need uh, uh, sort of kind of a prototype of what this ultimate purpose-driven organization would be like. What would it be like to work in such an organization? What would it be like to, to uh, be a client of such an organization? Because we always have these great uh, stories about uh, heroes, you know, the hero's myth. I'm not sure if you wrote, read the works of Joseph Campbell about uh, the hero with a thousand faces. The hero's journey. Exactly, yeah. the hero's journey. There, there are so many stories about what a great individual uh, is like and how they behave, how they are in the world. But there are not so many stories about the ultimate organization. So, and I asked, and uh, especially when you talked about, or when you said to me, like, we're going to discuss this topic. I was like, that's amazing, because I've been thinking about that for a long time. 
and I have a spiritual teacher. And um, so I asked him as well, like, what would an organization be like? So we, we, I asked him the question, like, uh, you know, we often talk about the, the greatest potential of human being is to become enlightened. But then what if an organization could be enlightened? What would be an, organ- an enlightened organization be like? So we discussed that in, in quite depth. And it's a, it's a very interesting topic, but also... Um, yeah, I think I think it will be really helpful for people to get a picture of that. So we can just try to see if we can together build such a, uh, a company in in, in uh, paint a picture of such a company. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it because it is so easy right now. You know, it's the whole world is connected. Mm-hmm. So for people who are searching for answers, it's much easier to find them. Yeah, like how we got in touch. We were speaking about it half an hour ago. It is so easy. Yeah. You recognize that somebody gets it, you get in touch, you start talking about it. Yeah. Then when you reflect on how the world currently works, it is really easy to be dissatisfied, to mm-hmm. see that human beings are uh, often a bit like robots, just doing work that has not yet been automated, mm-hmm. uh, that organizations are money-driven, yeah. and so they lose sight of the actual outcome that we're looking to create. All of these things... But I'm the type of guy that says, I want to find solutions. Mm -hmm. It's okay to see a problem, to analyze it, to look at it, to understand it. Now do you have a better plan? Yeah. So that's what I love exploring. One thing, one image that I always have in mind when I think of the ideal purpose-driven organization Mm -hmm. is an image that I saw again yesterday evening when I was driving home. And it's summertime, so it was still light. And as I was driving over the highway... There was this flock of birds Mm -hmm. flying from above one field over the highway to the other side. It was one lump of 60, 70, 80 birds Mm -hmm. flying in a group. And one thing I heard about it is that in these groups of birds, when they flock together, sometimes they shoot all together to the left, all together to the right. There is not one leader. There's not one bird that is being followed by the other birds. Instead, it seems to be that there's one mind. Mm -hmm. That the birds think the same in the same moment and they move as one. Yeah. (laughs) Hello, Babette. (laughs) I have that image in mind when I think of a purpose-driven organization. Does this mean anything to you? Well, I think there are a couple of principles when it comes to these how these birds function. You know, I've once read that you could create a computer animation that has the same uh, with only with three principles just like have the same speed as the bird next to you you know uh, um, go away when a bird comes your way it's like these simple principles and based on those principles then the whole uh, group of birds will just go on and but then you also come maybe to the point of 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 a movement because it's somehow also a movement, you know, it, it moves, it goes somewhere. And uh, sometimes great organizations have a lot of similarities with the movement. And there's not just one leader that's controlling everything. It's more like a, driven by, by, uh, by a vision or, or a shared vision or a shared purpose. Right. Yeah. Okay, so we're already collecting some ingredients yeah. here. It's a movement? Well, it acts as a movement. I'm not sure if it is a movement. But it definitely... Um, there are, I think there are a couple of ingredients, and we can just go into them. And I can also paint a picture of the, 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 or the most purpose-driven organization that I've ever worked with, which was not a business. But I can explain uh, what it was, and also why I think it's important, and what the lessons can be from that organization that I worked in, uh, and how you can maybe apply them in a business, even though that's really hard. But some of the ingredients are, uh, and I think I got this from Jean Piaget, the de- developmental psychologist. He called that, I guess, the equilibrated state. Like, uh, they often use the metaphor, if I'm correct, uh, for society, use the metaphor as a game. And the equilibrated game would be like the game in which everything worked harmoniously. And one of the, 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 uh, it was necessary 
to reach that level when, first of all, all of the participants played voluntarily because they wanted to play, not because they had to play. And I think that's where we already have a problem with, with our, the current way we run business. What, what, is, what is the current engagement rate? Uh, oh, I, I read this Gallup study where they said that only 13% of global employees globally are engaged with the company they work with. About 70 or 80 percent was disengaged, and you even had like a group that was actively disengaged, I mean, like the people that are like screaming, like I don't agree, you know, those, those kind of people. Except they, they're but so very bad. disengaged, and I think <laughs> that's also the reason because many many people are still depending on uh, on work to have a salary. So they don't go to work because they really want to do the work. They go to work because they need a salary. So that's not the voluntary. Uh, voluntary drive that I think Jean Piaget meant with the liberated state. So that's already one of the ingredients. If you have all people playing a game voluntarily, uh, the chances are way higher that you get into a harmonious state. I like it. I like it. So um, there, there needs to be a voluntary action. And obviously, every human being inside the organization is purpose-driven too. Exactly, yeah. Because an organization is a collection of individuals. You cannot yeah. be fully purpose-driven and have a few people who are doing something that they want to be doing. Yeah. What is needed for an individual to to find their path and to feel completely at ease and maybe even excited about what they do every day? I think first of all, or one of the things that's very important when it comes to work is that you find a job that matches your personality. Because personality is not easy to change. It's it's easier to find a job that matches your personality than to try and change your personality so it matches the job. Because if you do something that that that's that fits your personality, it costs you less energy. You have this you probably get the feeling like, hey, this is what I should be doing because I'm good at this. I think that's one of the things that often uh, people find out too late after they got a burnout. They find out like, oh, wait a minute, maybe that's not that was not yeah. the job that suits my personality. So that's one of the things. I also think from a broader perspective that you need to work in an organization that shares the same values personal uh, as your personal values. Because if there's a misalignment between your values and uh, the values of the current culture in the organization, you will always feel that you don't really belong. And you may even feel that you have to act in a way that you think you should be should be acting, but then what happens is you have you're living with this facade. You know, you're constantly trying to fit into a role, but what happens if you have have a facade all day? You're constantly um, it's constantly the fear of let's say falling out of the role, so you're not yourself. And there's an old I think Zen saying that says, relaxation is who you are, tension is who you think you should be. Wow. So this relaxation on your personality level is very important that you have the feeling like, hey, I am, I am valued the way I am. And this is also shown by a research done by Google. They, they did a research um, to find out what were the ingredients of their best performing teams. And I think the main ingredient they found out that all of their best performing teams had in common was psychological safety. The idea that I can take a risk without falling out of the group if I fail. The idea, the, the, the knowledge that I can ask a dumb question without falling out of the group. The, this, this feeling that I can be who I am without having the fear of falling out of the group. That's, that psychological safety is the glue that holds great teams together. And I think that's absolutely necessary. And that's hugely at risk in organizations we work at today. So that's one of the reasons. But then we go into ingredients. Look, like, what are all the ingredients? I think it's better. Yeah. So before we go into the ingredients, let's start with what is the goal? Exactly. That's, what, that's a good one. I think we should paint the picture of, like, what is actually an organization? But then we have to go one step back. What is a human being? You know, because we, we create organizations. Yeah. So what drives us? Yeah. And, you know, we have all sorts of drives. And... Um, and if I look at organizations, or let's say the purpose-driven organizations, they're driven... I'm not sure if they're actually driven. 
because if you're driven that means also like you're not in control you're not like uh, autonomous it's like something drives you and but we can go into that later I think one of the things that's important is when it comes to purpose purpose is something that you bring the world it's not about what you take from the world the working definition I always use when it comes to a purpose is a purpose is the difference you're trying to make I got that from this from Roy Spence who is a who wrote the book it's not what you sell it's what you stand for purpose is the difference you're trying to make mission is how you do it vision is how you see the world after you've done both and so the question is what is the difference you're trying to make well if you start an organization and I, I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs and I often immediately find out what their true intentions are you know some entrepreneurs say Alex look I've got this fantastic idea this idea is gonna make me rich but then there are the, are the entrepreneurs that say, Alex, I've got this great idea. This idea is going to enrich the world. Yeah. It's a completely different intention. The one is like, I want to have something. The other one is I want to add something. And I think that's where the purpose-driven organization starts. That you have, you have something, whether it's a skill, a talent, a product, a service, whatever, that's truly beneficial to other people. And that you just want to share. And it's a very personal thing as well. What, what I noticed is that as soon as I was working on an organization and seeing it in my mind's eye as something external from myself, mm -hmm. some entity I was creating, the experience was completely different mm -hmm. than right now where I am living my life, being myself, being present here now in the current moment and doing what I do best. And what flows from there is something mm -hmm. bigger than me in the form of an organization. Yeah. So that is me living my life, using my talents, creating value where it is asked from me. Mm -hmm. And at some point that energy flow becomes so large that I need team members. Yeah. Or the team members will be attracted to join the mission because there's more work to do than... I will be doing alone. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Because and then it starts becoming kind of a movement when it's driven by the right intentions, the most truthful intention, uh, which is I think to share, because those are actually the two. And then, and, uh, because that's also the idea of the uh, of the uh, infinite game. Um, I use that a lot in my in my uh, workshops where we talk about business as the infinite game. Because this is from the work, I think it's done by James Cars, who wrote the book Finite and Infinite Games. And he said there are actually, in theory, two kinds of games that one can play. One is the finite game, which has a fixed goal, and the goal is usually to win. And to make that happen, the finite goal always has um, uh, fixed rules, uh, agreed upon up front. You know, like a running match. Uh, you can't just run before you hear the gunshot. You know, you're disqualified. The, the rules are fixed. Because otherwise you don't know when you, uh, when you have reached the goal or when, whether or not you won the game. So that's a finite game. Then the other one is the infinite game. An infinite game doesn't have a goal because there's no end. But it does have a purpose. Yeah. And the purpose of an infinite game is to continue the play. Yeah. And that's why an infinite game has flexible rules because the rules only exist to keep the game going. And one of the great examples that I always use in my workshop of an infant game is gardening. I, I even had this guy in my workshop. He said, you're right, it's an endless game because I've been doing that for 40 years and it has never ended. Yeah, yeah. And the rules change constantly. In the winter, there are different rules and in the summer. And, but it, the, the whole purpose of it is to, 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 to be, to grow and to continue. There's, there's no winning or losing in an infinite game. There's only uh, going ahead. Progress. Progress. Yeah. In that in that matter, and I always think about. I always ask uh, CEOs or business owners like, "What game are you in? Are you playing a finite game or are you playing an infinite game?" Yeah. And they often they they're playing as if they are in the infinite game, or the finite game. They have to win. They have to be better than others. It's constantly about uh, reaching something, whereas the infinite game is way more about developing, growing having other people to join the game, you know, to make the game bigger so more people can enjoy the game. So that's why you hire more and more employees to 
to grow the game and to have more people involved. And not just for the sake of growth as in the numbers you have, but growth as in the development to, be, to, be, to, to play better, to have a better game. I love that. I love that. So, okay. L let me throw in an additional word into yeah. this discussion. Flow. Yeah. Um, so the way I've grown to see the world is we move around, mm -hmm. not only through space, up, down, sideways, yeah. back and forth. We also move through time. So when I started to understand life as me moving through time, other people moving through time, and look here, you and I, now we collide in four mm -hmm. dimensions. We meet right here, right now. Your path has led all the way up to here. You are right now older than you've ever been in your life. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, you special, too. <laughs> special day today. I feel so special. <laughs> yeah. So when we speak about a purpose-driven organization, um, for people to join that organization, I think it is supposed to be the right next step for them in their personal life, for their personal flow in mm. that moment. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah, I think so. And that's, then we also come back to that it should be voluntary. They should have the feeling that they, need, that they want to be part of this. It feels, it makes sense. I think that's the right word. It makes sense to do this at this moment in time. And that's why we, that's often when we make decisions, you know, because I always make the, the difference between a conclusion and a decision. A conclusion is like the rational mind that says, based on all the data, it's the right thing to do would be this, based on what I know. But then there's like the intuitive emotional mind. Yeah, I know, but this feels better. I think I'm going to go with this side. And then you decide to go that way because it makes more sense. And you can't explain why it makes more sense. You know, that's, that's yeah. the interesting thing. But when you, when you do what you have to do, you know it makes sense. And that's where meaning comes in. It feels meaningful. And then you have flow. But I think one of the distinctions I often make, which I think is very important when we talk about the purpose-driven organization, and I've learned this from studying the work of Eric Fromm, who is a was a psychoanalyst. And in the 70s, I think in 1976, he wrote the book To Have or To Be, which was for me like mind-blowing because... He actually pointed out that there are two existential ways of being in the world. One is the having mode and the other one is the being mode. From the having mode, I see everything that I do as, as um, a, a means to have something or to, to own something, to possess something. And um, that's like, in a way, the ego mind. The ego mind identifies with what it has. You know, I have this job, I have this relationship, I have these friends, I have this image. This is who I am. But then from pointed out very intelligently, if I am what I have and I lose what I have, who then am I? Yeah. And then you get to the being mode. The being mode is the mode that all the great teachers have always promoted. And it's about being. And we both have, bo we have the... We have, let's say, having needs and being needs. Having needs, I need to have water, I need to have food, I need to have shelter. But what we do, we mix up the two. Uh, we try to fulfill the being needs with the having, from the having mode. You know, so I feel empty because, I, because I'm not being who I am and I try to, buy a new, to try to have a new car to fill up the void, which doesn't work because we mix up the two. But from the being mode, from the being perspective, being is also becoming because that's that's the same you know to exist means to become you know you're constantly becoming and those are the needs like the de developmental needs we need to develop we need to grow up we need to wake up these are all the things that have to be with have to do with the being mode now i think what's important when it comes to business because being is also our creativity it's to create it's to be in the world to to use our potential in a, in a meaningful manner. And from that, we know we are in the being mode when we experience flow. You know, we are completely absorbed with, by what we do. And we are not thinking, our mind is quiet. And we are just uh, actively participating uh, with life. It's a participatory um, uh, yeah, development in a way. And I think what we often do in business is we approach everything from the having mode 
You know, we want to grow the business. We want to have these results. We want to have these profits. We want to have this. And even when I talk to, when I hear often uh, leaders uh, discuss their business with their people, it's often about what we need to have. Yeah. What we need to have. But does, that doesn't inspire anyone. That's like, people want to know what are we going to build? What are we going to create? What, are, what value are we going to add to the world? And you know, and what I find out, the higher we go into ranks in the business, the less we talk about customers, about people, and the more we talk about numbers, spreadsheets, and all those things that we want to have. And then we all feel empty, and we all feel frustrated. And then what we're going to do, we're going to drink in the weekends, we're going to, you know, fill the void, that, that the, the emptiness that we experience because we're not living in the being mode. Yeah. And I think a purpose-driven organization is founded on that being mode. Who do we want to be? How do we want to be in the world? Rather than just what do we want to have? The image or the status or the or the, the possessions you know so I conclude from that that as an organization what you want to do is create a fertile ground mm. give the the tools yeah the, 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 the stimulation the encouragement for the team mm -hmm. to be their best selves yeah to do what they're best at to use their talents their strengths and to flourish from there. So it's more about yeah. nurturing, almost like a garden, yeah. and letting it grow how it's supposed to grow, rather than telling the grass, listen grass, yeah, grow faster. you better be 15 centimeters two weeks from now, exactly. else you disappoint me. Yeah. This brings me to one important conclusion I made myself. Um, I worked for big corporates, for small startups, very fast growing. Yeah. I've managed hundreds of people in my life. And generally, they were happy with me as a manager. And um, one of the points of feedback I got is that I was always there to help them, to serve mm -hmm. them. And for myself, the biggest impact came when I made a mental click where I said, you know what? I grew up with the idea that as a manager, I'm supposed to be a boss who tells people what to do. I don't know where I got it from, probably in movies mm -hmm. or how I heard my parents and uncles and aunts talk about work on birthday parties. Then I realized what would happen when all managers will regard themselves a coach, a coach of a team of champions, highly skilled, highly talented individuals and their sole purpose is to elevate the team, to create that fertile ground and nurture them. How do you see this fitting in? I think it's, it's, it's how it should be in a way it depends a bit how you define coach but I think what what I really enjoy is the idea that often the way we 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 um, conceptualize a business is that you know you have the leadership and you have the employees you have the customers you have the uh, say the shareholders and then it's always like um, the leadership serves the shareholders you know the employees serve uh, both the manager and the customer, you know, and then, uh, or, or even um, the, the, the employees serve the leadership and the customers almost have to serve like the employees, you know, in, in bad cases. But I think the, the, it's the other way around, is that the leadership serves the employees, the employees serve the customers and the customers serve the shareholders in a way, you know. Yeah. And so it's more like, um, and I, I think I once wrote the sentence on, on, I think on Instagram, like, you know, from my own personal experience, that when I had a great leader, what I worked with, I didn't feel like I worked for him. I felt he works for me, you know, because he was constantly asking me, like, what do you need to succeed? What do you need from me? What can I do for you? He wasn't uh, telling me, like, uh, what I did wrong, you know, or uh, came in like, this is wrong, this is wrong, what <laughs> most managers do. He just came in like, do you need help? Is there something you need? And that was like, I wanted to work like crazy for this person, you know? And I was constantly feeling like, hey, I'm valued. I even realized that when I spoke to most managers in companies I worked with, I had the feeling they're important. But when I talked to the great leaders, I had the feeling I was important. And, um, and I think that's where the coaching comes in. Like when, if you understand that your job is if your job is not to serve customers, then your job is to serve those who serve customers. I think, I'm not sure who said that, but it's a, it's a well-known uh, saying. I think that's absolutely right. It's 
that's what I used yeah. to tell my teams. I said, listen, guys, you do all the hard work. You are talking to customers all the time. You're doing the projects. All mm -hmm. I do is walk around in the office, sit in meetings, send emails. Yeah. So the only reason for my existence as a manager is to make sure that you can serve more customers better yeah. and faster in a more fun way than you could without me. But now the problem is, what happens when the numbers go down? And your manager says, hey, wait a minute, it's not going well, you have to push them. They need to, uh, they need to improve, you need to improve, otherwise you're out. Yeah. So what happens then? Yeah, that's when, when such a conflict arises, that's when I say, interesting, we can learn something here. It's in the periods of conflict where you mm -hmm. learn most. So my immediate instinct says, when there's an issue, a problem, a conflict like this, zoom in. Mm -hmm. analyze understand what's going on there's a tool that i recommend every company i work with it's called sikra yeah it means when you have an issue like that you're going to analyze summary what's going on what where when who how the impact mm -hmm. in terms of energy money for all the stakeholders involved the cause ask five times why why are the numbers going down why 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 Resolution action. So, mm -hmm. summary, impact, calls, resolution, action. When you zoom in like that, now you have context. Now you can understand why do the numbers go down, what is the impact of the team, what is my impact. Yeah. And we can take it from there. Because my experience with that is, and that's where it, where it becomes difficult, and I've worked in a lot of companies where there's a lot of fear involved. And, 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 and it often happens when results are not what they are expected to be. You know, and then all of a sudden there's tension in the company. So then the leadership says to the middle management, like, numbers need to go up and then everyone is pushing each other. But what actually happens is there's this idea of scarcity. We don't have enough. And then we, end up, we, then we end up in the having mode again. In uh, finite game. And what happens, we are in this finite game. And what happens when you're in the having mode, fear kicks in, I don't have enough. And it's even been researched in the book that's called Scarcity by, I think, an economic economist from Princeton and a psychologist from Harvard, if I remember correctly, that what scarcity does to the mind, and it makes us less intelligent, and it makes us definitely less creative, because fear can, use, can be used as a motivator to make us more productive only when it's mechanical action. You know, we can run faster if, there's like a, if we're being punished, but we cannot become more creative, because in order to be creative, the mind needs to be relaxed. Because then we are open to, to uh, make, a, how do you call it, a synthesis between different ideas and come up with new ideas. New connections. But when, when we, once we have tension, scarcity, we're in the control mode, in the having mode, and we want to control everything, and then we're, there's no creativity. And what I often see happening is that then all of a sudden people become very productive and efficient, they're going to run, and then they're all running efficiently in the wrong direction. And then what do you have then? You have a problem. Because there's no creative person that oversees everything and said, wait a minute, we're, we're, we're going wrong here. Yeah. And it already starts going wrong with the word result. So there's one thing exactly. that most people don't understand about results, is that a result is something else than reality. Mm -hmm. So reality is about a desired outcome we're looking to create. Um, a thing or a product we're producing or an emotion inside the client that's real life that's what's actually happening the numbers we track mm -hmm. to give us kind of a clue of what's going on they're a very simplified way of expressing that reality mm -hmm. so as soon as you start chasing results the risk is that you lose track of what it is really about yeah exactly because the results are some simply the results are the they're the results of doing everything else right you know and if you focus only on the results that's uh, that's what i realized is that when i focus on results the process will take longer but if i start focusing on the process then the results come faster and uh, and it's the difference between input and output but i think it's even way bigger and that's what i why i wanted to talk to you about the ultimate purpose-driven organization because I've worked in one um, and it was not a business but it was like a, an organization I would say that functions on the 
laws of nature rather than the fabricated laws of industry or, or, or production, so as, as we call it. And that's a, a, a Dhamma organization that does the Vipassana meditation that I'm a part of. Because um, I started doing Vipassana meditation, which is the, called Vipassana means insight, or to see things as they are. And it's yeah, one of the most ancient uh, meditation techniques, uh, born uh, or tracing all the way back to the Buddha who taught this to people. And that technique was gone in India because it had been um, uh, yeah, changed by people and, and it wasn't pure anymore. But in Burma, the technique was saved for ages and ages uh, due to the uh, teachings of families teaching, uh, having a teacher, teaching another teacher, and then for ages all the way back until it was rediscovered. And the great thing about meditation, uh, I did my first meditation retreat, it's a 10 day retreat, that's the shortest amount of time uh, to teach, to, to, to learn a technique. So I thought I want to teach, I want to learn meditation, so why not go for the 10 days so I immediately know it. It's a silent retreat, so you're not allowed to talk, not allowed to make eye contact to people. And I went in there, and it was life-changing. Um, but then what I, found, what I found out is the way it is set up is it's run by an organization based on volunteers. No one works there. No one really owns the meditation centers. So how do they get money? If you are going to this retreat, you are being said that it's for free. And it is, because it has actually been paid by someone else for you to do that. So then at the end of the retreat, they ask you, like, you are allowed to give a donation, but only if you truly feel that this was beneficial to your life and you feel like you want to give it to someone else as well. If you don't feel that, you're not allowed to give a donation. So don't feel obliged to give something. And also keep in mind that if you cannot miss the money, don't feel obliged to give something. Only if you feel like you want to and you can. Then you're allowed to leave a donation. And based on that simple principle, that, that organization is growing worldwide. There comes, there's more money coming in than then it goes out. But then what I found out is what's so brilliant about this organization is that while you're doing the meditation, people need to cook. There's like 100 people meditating and there's like meals, beautiful meals every day made by volunteers. And even the, 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 the kitchen, the toilets is cleaned by, by, by volunteers. You know, they work hard like more than 10 hours a day for 10 days in a row to make it happen for you so you can do your meditation. And it's amazing how much gratitude you experience, especially on day 10 where you can all talk again for the people who serve the course. So then what happened, I did a few more of these retreats and then uh, a few weeks ago, a few months ago already, I served my first course. So that means I had to work in the kitchen and clean the toilets for 10 days in a row and waking up at five, being in the kitchen at 5.30 in the morning and just work till, and I think you go to bed at 9, 9.30, then the day's over. And you meditate about three hours at that day uh, with the group, but for the rest you're just working. You're uh, peeling the uh, carrots, you're cutting the potatoes, you know, you're cleaning the toilets, whatever you have to do. And what I realized while I was doing that, that this was the, 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 the best example of a purpose-driven organization that I've ever experienced. Yeah. Because you were only allowed to be a servant if, you've only, if you have sit a course, a 10-day course first. Because you need to experience, or you need to know that it is truly beneficial. It's not, you need to believe it, like with religion. No, you need to know it because it has transformed your, yourself. So then you can serve the course. But the serving is great because everyone who serves there has done this course, or has done many courses. So there's already a connection. And of course, everyone is connected. But what we lack is the experience that, that we are connected. We're already connected to everyone. But this is, but in this uh, organization, you also feel connected. And the funny thing is, I remember that I came in there and it was like, okay, here, get a room, there's some rooms, and then go to the kitchen and then you can work. So I uh, left my bag at the, at the room 
I went to the kitchen. I got like this. Uh, what's it called? Uh, apron. Apron, and I and I was like, okay, get to work. And then I was like with ten people. I haven't seen them before. No one knows each other. And it's like, okay, you're the manager. You're like the cook. Uh, everyone has some responsibilities. And boom, get to work. And within a few hours, there's a meal for 100 people. And everything works. There are no problems. Everyone works hard. There's no stress. And I was like, what is going on here? How can this be possible? There was even a woman in my group. She has like a, uh, how do you call it in English? Like a chronic fatigue syndrome. She couldn't work properly because she was always struggling with fatigue. But there she could like work 10 hours a day for 10 days in a row without getting too tired. So it's like, what is the difference here? And there are many aspects to it that make it such a fantastic organization. One is that at all times, peace and harmony is the most important. Priorities. Priorities, definitely. Another thing is that the values are clear because you, you kind of live the values that are also embodied by the Buddha or the, 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 the Buddhistic principles, let's say. But they're also translated in simple rules. And that's where we often go wrong. We have like values in a company, like you look at our core values, but they're not translated into clear behaviors. How do you apply them? How do you apply them indeed? And one of the principles that we work with at the Vipassana Meditation Center is noble speech. Because if you're meditating, there's like noble silence, which means you're not allowed to talk. In the kitchen, you have to talk because you have to work together. So they work with noble silence, or noble speech, sorry, which means I'm only allowed to talk if it's one, true, helpful, and relevant. Nice. That's why proper timing is important. So what that did to me was it made me very aware of how I use my voice. You know, because I'm, when, especially when I feel uh, feel very good, I start to become more humorous, I make jokes, and I feel like, oh, wait a minute, uh, is it helpful? Yes, it's true. Yes, some, some jokes are true. Is it the right timing? Yeah, it can be. But I also became aware that sometimes the jokes are not beneficial for the process, right. you know? So, so you become very aware of, um, of, your, of yourself and the way you use your voice. So it really helped to keep the atmosphere uh, properly focused on the work. Uh, and people didn't feel this tension. And I asked the woman who had this fatigue syndrome, like, how can you work in this setting? So good. And, and not in a Dutch company. And she said, one of the things is that what I feel here is I don't have to socialize all the time. I don't have to win anything. I don't have to win someone's, uh, you know, goodwill. Yeah. Or uh, it's not necessary. And so that relieved her a lot. But the other ingredients were that everyone is there with the same intention. You want to spread the Dhamma, you know, the, the path of the Buddha, because you know how beneficial it is to your life and how beneficial it will be to the lives of the students who you are serving. So there's this great humility also in there. You feel like I'm, I'm doing work that's really meaningful. It helps. And I think that's one of the cornerstones of, of, of a purpose-driven organization. The work must be meaningful. Absolutely. Otherwise, people have like this, they're spiritually exhausted. So that was one of the things. But what, also, what I also found out, what's so interesting, was that I remember a moment... It was somewhere in the morning. It was seven in the morning. And then the, 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 the vegetable guy came by with his car, like, like uh, really happy, you know. And then we had like this nice uh, uh, garden with the stock room in it. And then he brought the vegetables. And then a few hours later, the guy with the fruits came in driving. Like they were just local people. And they were like, um, they knew the sender very well. So they were all happy. And then you walk outside, you hear the birds. And there's this very peaceful environment and everything we do, everything we use, the vegetables, everything is being recycled and put to the garden for compost. And you feel like you're really in touch with your environment, like, like uh, in a way that I've never experienced before, in, 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 because maybe because I live in Amsterdam. And that made me feel so peaceful. And then I remember that I was responsible for giving food to the teachers. So I had to prepare the meals for the teachers, put them in the trays and bring them to the teacher facility. And I remember one moment in the morning that the vegetable guy just came in and everyone was working silently. You know, there was a great atmosphere. Everyone was in flow. That, that's how you notice. Everyone was absorbed by the work, using their skills to just get the work done. And no socializing or not unnecessary socializing. 
and I was walking in the garage because I had to walk through the garage to go to the t-shirt store and I walked to the garage and then the door was open and the sun was shining in and there were like these lines with the laundry someone just folded the laundry like perfectly you know like the towels and everything and I looked at it and I experienced the I don't know what it was but I got goosebumps and all of a sudden I felt home and I was like what is home and then I realized home is where you arrive when there's no desire to be elsewhere. And I realized something very profound, which was that in the, even in the most mundane places that you can be, like a garage, which looks very mundane, you can experience the essence of, of, of living, which was something like, like I, I don't know how to put it in words yet, but I had this very profound, almost spiritual experience that uh, a humble experience in a way that I felt like, yeah, this is where I want to be to just do meaningful work, which kind of felt like I was justifying my existence, you know, because everyone has mistakes and do stu does stupid things. But right here, right now, I could do something useful, you know, and that felt like very uh, fulfilling. But also because there was peace and harmony and everyone was working towards something greater than themselves, which was spreading this technique. Uh, because it's so beneficial and then I was like wow this is actually fantastic and then again one of the things I realized like what we cannot get in the corporate environment is people work there voluntarily you can't say to someone you know you need to work harder because otherwise we we throw you out and get a cheaper person in that works harder because there were no costs you know Every, all help was welcome and that was a realization I was like yeah how can we put that into a corporate environment but there were many aspects of it, but I think the most important ones was that people really felt like the work was meaningful, it really mattered to someone, but also to ourselves. And that's where, where the other thing that becomes important. And that's where, where, where I started talking about the having mode versus the being mode. From the having mode, I didn't gain anything from this experience. I didn't get any money for working there, you know? Yeah. I didn't get a higher status or whatever. I didn't get a better identity. But from the being mode, I developed myself in a way that I dis learned to discipline myself. I also learned to develop myself because what you learn in, in serving this course rather than sitting the course is that you learn to apply the mindfulness techniques while you're working. So I got to learn how to work mindfully using noble speech. So from a being perspective, from a developmental perspective, I grew tremendously in 10 days. So that gave me a sense of fulfillment as well. So both the serving others and growing as a human being. And I think those are the two very important elements when it comes to creating a purpose-driven organization. The people should grow uh, de developmental-wise, grow into a better person. And they should feel like what they do is meaningful. It serves a good cause or something like that, a noble cause. So I think that was, to me, the most, yeah. the greatest example of an organization that was so purpose-driven. And that could exist within a capitalistic society, even though it didn't really apply the same rules. And what I noticed from that, or what I learned from that, is that, and I learned that from my spiritual teacher, he taught me that, that there's only two movements in life, which is the in-breath and the out-breath. You know, breathing in, breathing out. What actually means there's only receiving and sharing. And actually this whole system of the Vipassana organization was based on the principle. It's sharing the technique, receiving donations, sharing the technique, receiving donations or receiving uh, gratitude or whatever. It's based on receiving and sharing, not taking and giving. It's receiving and sharing. That's a natural process. And I think that's a natural way. It's the same when we get a great idea. The natural response is not to sell it, it's to share it. You know, only in a society where I fear that I do not have enough or I am not enough, you know, I, I want to sell the idea so I have more. But in that little environment that I worked, that wasn't the case, you know, there was no fear of not having enough. And I think, you know, now, but now the question is how can we translate some of these fundamental principles into a corporation? Yeah. Well, one question I have, first of all, I love this story and I, I see what you see. It's, mm -hmm. it's very purpose driven, um, based on these fundamental laws of nature. Yeah. 
and you could feel it eventually you I feel mean, it when you're part of it you definitely feel it you know it. it feels right it feels right and that's all you need to know how does it feel yeah one question i have and i would love a yes or no answer to this is it possible for a publicly traded company to be purpose driven <laughs> Yeah, it's yes and no in a way. I, I, I feel it's, I think that's such a hard question. My my response will be no, but I also look. If I look at the world the way it's all set up, I become sometimes pessimistic. But then when I look at human beings, I become very optimistic because I feel, and that's my yes. My yes is that we as human beings can can have the truth as our first priority we can live by the truth we can we can kind of and that's the the whole idea of all the religious stories the heroes myths you know as an individual you can make a change in the existing structures you can and that would be my yes if you have an organization but that the, the difficult thing is and i see where why you asked this question probably look I always say that the inventor of a great idea often has their heart in it and they build an organization around it to share it, you know, they're, they're driven from, the, it's like from the heart, you know, and if, if you have your heart in the business, what you do is you put all you have into it, but if you're the investor and you, all you have is your money into it, what you want is you want to take the best out of it. Yeah. And that's, that's the problem. Yeah, there's that's really a problem. That's why many startup owners say like be self-funded as long as you can, because when people who have no heart in the business just only have their money in the business, you have a it's really problematic. It 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 really is. I see that happening a lot. Yeah, because then it becomes a numbers game, at the well, cost of the of the long-term health of the organization. But but that's all the. But in the other way, that's also the tensions you always have to deal with. You always have the, ten the tensions between different interests. And, and a good leader can somehow manage or uh, manage expectations from all shareholders in a way that's healthy for the company. But it puts a tremendous pressure and responsibility on the leader. It's true. Yeah, the intention of the investor yeah. must be fully aligned. We're on the same mission. Yeah. And we believe in the same things. Money has the same yeah. meaning to us then it's possible. And with publicly traded companies, well, first of all, it's called publicly traded. Mm -hmm. but of course, it's not publicly traded. The company doesn't believe to uh, belong to everyone mm -hmm. when it's on a stock exchange. It, yeah. be it belongs to the richest of the richest institutions yeah. and human beings who have made money their goal. And there we go, now you're chasing a result, yeah. not an actual outcome not mm -hmm. an actual value creation yeah, process. Exactly. So that's where I see that, that, that the system is corrupt. Integrity is not possible, not mm -hmm. full 100% integrity, unless we, we arrive at, at some super idealistic situation yeah. where it just all clicks together. Yeah. And I, I used to think when I was younger, always in, and I, I, had, a, I had this, uh, uh, I was thinking about this almost philosophically, about this problem and I made it a bit smaller because uh, I, I worked with a team it was a team of uh, in, a, in a retail industry I had this store manager and I had a team of people and um, so what happened is this manager um, constantly fired people because they were not motivated enough so he hired more motivated people but within no time they were demotivated so he was like I need to have my team motivated so he asked me like Alex how can I get my team motivated. So I had to bring the, I had to make him realize that he, he, his job was not somehow to motivate them. His job was simply to stop demotivating them. He, he couldn't see how his procedures, his rules, the, the, the culture he created had become unhealthy in a way that whenever people came in, they felt demotivated. The work wasn't meaningful. It was all about numbers. People were not really valued. Uh, there was no gra gratitude from the manager. There was only like, you need to perform, otherwise you're out. There was no psychological safety. All the things we talked about were not present. 
so then I, I thought about that very, very uh, deeply because I was emotionally involved with that, you know, and that's, and then what happens when I'm in the shower, even I think about these projects. And I remember that I was walking in a Vondel park clear, close to my house and I saw this flower and I was like, it's the same when the flower doesn't grow. You're not trying to push the flower or motivate. You just take, take care of the surroundings. You give it water, you, you know, you make sure it has enough sunlight. And then it f f uh, starts uh, blooming. So I wrote down, when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. And I posted it online and it went absolutely viral. And now people use it for all sorts of problems. Yeah. Which also eventually made me think. And then I get into the chicken or the egg problem. Do we need to change the system or does the change need to come from the individual? And I always thought about, yeah, you know, as, uh, and I've heard that in different system thinking theories, that a, a bad system always beats a good person, you know. But then, again, how do we change the system? It's only by building a better system. You know, that's, the, 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 that's what, what uh, what's his name? Richard Buckman Sefola said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. Just change something, build a new model that makes the... The, the existing model obsolete. So again, I thought, no, we don't need to change this. First, there needs to be an inner transformation. We need to change ourselves so that we can create better systems or better ways of working. We need to be creative in that matter. So again, it starts with an individual, I, get, I think. But that's always a discussion. You know, do we need to change the system? or Because I think, and that's where the religious stories... Are, are right or the old even the, the the good Disney movie you know there's always the structure there's always the good king and the evil king there's always the the good individual the bad individual whatever and it's always this this balance it's an ongoing fight between good and evil and uh, and, and and especially within ourselves as well you know our 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 evil intentions our good intentions it's a constant battle and and when we start blaming the system, what we actually do is we give away our own responsibility to change. And we say like, yeah, as long as the system's not going to change, I'm not going to do anything. And then what? You you just vanish away at home? You're part of the problem. I think that's also not, not the right way. Yeah. So what, what change can you make? Yeah. I think that's where it all goes back to. Yeah. Uh, there's, there was once, I was once in a funny, uh, a great leadership training. And then the the woman who uh, facilitated the training ended with like an old story about an old king who wanted to collect the greatest wisdom of the wor world and then translate it into one simple sentence. And then eventually the sentence was, if it is to be, it is up to me. The greatest wisdom they collected. And I really think that's true. You know, if there, if there is something that needs to change, then, you know, you have to do it. No one's going to do it for you. Personal responsibility. And then you come to personal responsibility, you, you, uh, purpose, staying, you know, integrity. I think it's really important, which means a wholeness in the way, yeah? to be to be whole, to be, to be, so you can't be corrupted in a way, you know, that's very important. Yeah. But I get your problem, what you say about you can't have integrity, you know, if the system is corrupt. And, I, you know, I think even in, because truthfulness and integrity is so important. But if you have a very corrupt system, you know, that, that kind of destroys the spirit, you know, it's very difficult to stand up because you risk your life in some situations, you know. Yeah. Alexander, one hour flew by already. Yeah, definitely. We, we were clearly in flow. Meaningful conversations. Meaningful conversations is uh, what I love most and I get a sense that uh, <coughs> you're into that as well. So much value. Now, how do we sum it all up? Can you give three, four, five bullet points that are for you the, the key takeaways for purpose-driven organizations? Well, it starts with the leader, the, the person who starts the organization. They need to be purpose-driven as well. And I think one of the big elements of that is integrity, which means from the Latin word means, the original meaning means purity or wholeness. And in the old traditional, the spiritual traditions, people always talked about purity of mind. You need to purify your mind first. Because if you don't have a, let's say, level of integrity, then what you bring forth, your actions are not accurate and not, 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 not good as well. 
So it all starts with yourself. And integrity starts, I guess, with self-awareness. To become aware of what drives you. What are your motivations? And to integrate them in a way that they become solid and truthful. Because truthfulness is the key. The whole business needs to be driven by truthfulness in a way. Not by bullshit. And I think that's a very big big element if you want to b- make the ultimate uh, purpose of an organization. Yeah. Another one is that the work that... The purpose of the organization should be centered around improving people's lives or improving or serving life itself, you know? It should be life serving, not life degenerating. Uh, and that's really hard to do, but I think that those are very important elements to strive for. And and you know when you're doing that because if you do that, you know that the work you do is meaningful. Because that's the element that's one of the most important things. The work should be meaningful. People should understand that the work they do it should, doesn't necessarily have to be fun work, you know? When I did the uh, uh, peeling the carrots and all, it's not necessarily fun work, but it's meaningful. So uh, it's a way to serve other people. So it should be meaningful. So why is when is work meaningful? Um, and then we talk about the quickly about the being mode again that we talked about before. How does this work make me a better person? How does this develop my me as a human being from the being perspective? Um, and also, how does it serve the collective? How does it add any value to the world? So. Uh, the important thing is if I do my work, I need to know how is this useful to myself, to my development? Uh, what do I gain from it, from the being perspective, not just from the having perspective? And also, how does this serve other people? I think there you have the great elements of inspiration. When, we've, when we do something that's really worth doing, and it also is not only useful for ourselves, but also for more people that we work for, we often are highly motivated or inspired. So that's very important understanding the purpose of the work and uh, when we talk about team we st- talked about that before uh, psychological safety and my values need to be aligned with the values of the culture that I work with it otherwise I will ha- constantly feel that I'm not a part of this I need to feel like I'm part of something bigger um, of people that is a, a group of people that share the same values uh, because otherwise I will constantly have this tension that I have to feel like that I have to be different from who I am and that costs a lot of energy, and a lot of energy is gone to maintaining this role. So that's important. You're there voluntarily. And you're there voluntarily, definitely. You need, you're need. you there because you really want to serve this organization, because you truly know how this is beneficial. Yeah. One of the great things I, I remembered, I once saw a speech from a CEO from, from Harley-Davidson. You know, he was a new CEO. The, the company went, I don't, I don't remember correctly, but... I remember that he was a new CEO and he asked in his employees, like, who drives for Harley Davidson? Almost no one did. And he was like, look, we, we don't even know the experience of our own product. You know, so that, I think that's important. That's really important. And, uh, and I think one of the key elements, and this might be radical, but I truly believe it's true. Companies should stop making products that no one really needs. Really. Because I've worked with people who know that they're making products that no one in the world really needs. It's only just there to make some profit. People feel like it's, it's really soul deadening. I really believe that. And this might be radical because, uh, and, but it's something to strive for. You know, it's something to strive for. I really think so. I think that's really important. Um, yeah, and I think, and then again, we talked about harmony and peace, but that's the, the, that's the, that's the balance that's always uh, we need to have. If you serve your customers at the cost of your employees and everyone runs into burnouts, you know, you're also not doing a good job. Yeah. So how can you have a healthy balance? That's very important. Amazing. But that's, of course, you know, it's it's easy to put in words, but it's so difficult in practice. It's really difficult. Otherwise, there would be so many businesses that, that were, were the ultimate purpose-driven organizations. But we need an ideal to strive for, right? That's right. Something to aim for, and we might as well aim high. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing all your knowledge, your wisdom. There's been so much value in there. 
And uh, I'm sure there's going to be a part two because there's so much more to zoom in on. For now, everybody who got inspired, who was listening to you thinking, ah, that's the type of clarity I need in my life. That's a person who I want to be influenced by. Where do they go? Where do people find you? They can go to my website, alexanderdenheyer.com. Um, especially for the work uh, I do a lot of workshops and organizations I do together with a company called Zero Entropy I do uh, long term uh, culture transformation programs where we do total system change in some sense but I also recommend people to follow my Instagram I share daily insights my own ideas but also insights from other people uh, that's what I would recommend but if people truly want to improve themselves I would also suggest them to read the great classics re- read great books you know, the people I've been inspired by, like Eric Fromm, but also John Fervaki, who has a great lecture series on YouTube about waking up from the meaning crisis. I totally recommend to dive into that. But yeah, read, read great books. Sounds good. Thank you and so much. And experience. Uh, you know, go in the world, experience, get to know yourself, the operating manual, you know, and, uh, and improve yourself. Learn how to operate this beautiful machine. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Thank you so much for being here, You're for welcome. sharing your wisdom. Thanks for the invite. I really enjoyed it. And that was Alexander. Time flies. When I have conversations like these, I can talk like this for hours. And yeah, Alexander and I agreed we're going to meet up later this week and have some dinner and go over this a bit more in detail because there's just so much to discuss. But hey, the podcast, one hour, that's the goal. So one hour it is, and I'm sure that part two is going to be coming up. Earnmoreworkless.com, that's my website. That's where you can find all the other podcasts that I recorded and that I recorded in the past together with Lenka, then my wife. Now we're moving forward separately. All the podcasts are on earnmoreworkless.com. Alexander Den Heijer. If you were impressed by this interview, if it resonates, if it made you enthusiastic and committed to explore this topic, make sure you stay in touch. He's big on Instagram, you heard him, and he has a very nice website too. So I'm going to make sure I mention those in the show notes. That's all for now. I wish you a beautiful day. Make sure that you smile, that you are present right here in the current moment. So you can grasp all the beautiful moments that you will experience today. Enjoy!